And I used to take their pain and then close their eyes. They were really out pain. They couldn't move. They just couldn't put any weight on it and everything else. And I would say, describe the pain. What do you perceive? Because you cannot have a sensation or a feeling without content in the mind. I have been interested in this topic for a long time. When I was in professional school, I actually did a presentation on the origins of pain. And that led me to studying all different topics. John Bonica's work, classical work on the area of pain and neurology from New York, the Yellow Emperor's classic Chinese acupuncture, to you name it, even back into the great philosophers. What exactly is pain? What exactly is pleasure? Why are they there? What, what's it about? So I'm going to start with a quote, <clears throat> well, a paraphrased quote of a ancient Greek philosopher named Agnaxagoras. He's the one that really had an influence on my thinking of pain since I was 23. He said that pain and pleasure are lopsided perceptions. Now, most of us, when we bang our, our you know, shin on a table or something and go, ow, um, we create a stimulus on little nerve endings called nociceptors, which are pain nerve endings, C fibers, they call them, that go up into the spinal cord from the dorsal root of the spinal cord, go up the tracks of the spinal cord all the way up to the thalamus. And there, there's a gating mechanism based on our cortical perceptions to allow us to either experience or not. And with that cortex, the higher brain systems, we have the capacity to take that stimulus and associate it with many different things. For instance, if I, if I let's take uh, your thumb, put your thumb on a, on a table and I slam it with a, a, a sledgehammer and ow, ow, whoa, you're just, you feel like you broke your thumb and smashed it. If you just take that out of co that in that context, you probably think, wow, that's painful. It's you're angry or resentful, etc. But imagine if I was to take that thumb and put it there and I'd say, well, here's the deal. I'm going to give you a billion dollars cash tax free, um, a week traveling with the most uh, admired celebrity you could imagine, or supermodel or superstar that you'd want to meet. And they would be your escort for a week, traveling around the world in private jets and going to all the villas and all the luxury places in the world. And um, you also had the opportunity to have a brand new mansion or something. I mean, I gave you, and I stacked up all of the fantasies that you might've wanted in your life. I'm just making those up. I'm, those aren't really important to me, but but just imagine all of those, whatever you imagine, and you associate with that when I slam my thumb, I get all that. If you perceive more advantage and disadvantage to all those things, which may not be real true, but if you imagined it that way, you could actually go, yeah, slam that sucker. And if I told you that I would make sure that any damage to your thumb would be repaired perfectly, and in three weeks, you'd never even know it had it and a bruise, and a surgeon would take care of it. And you would have just three weeks of a little bit of aggravation from that, from that slamming, but you have, you got that now freedom to do what you want to do. Your own private jets, your own this and that. I bet if you would do that, I bet your perception of that pain would be different. You'd be celebrating that pain instead of, ow. When I was in practice years ago, this is nearly 40, I had a patient with osteosarcoma, which is a eroding clastic disease that basically eats the femur heads on the femur, which is down in the hips. And it just it reach, it eats away the bone and eventually you can't stand on it, it breaks. And the pain is pretty enormous, according to what most people describe. And I used to take their pain and then close their eyes. They were really out pain. They couldn't move. They just couldn't put any weight on it and everything else. And I would say, describe the pain. What do you perceive? Because you cannot have a sensation or a feeling without content in the mind. You cannot have fear without content in the mind. You cannot have pain without content in the mind. There's a representation and an association that's stacked up in your mind at the moment you're perceiving pain. 
So I would have them, this lady, go and, and describe her pain. Is it throbbing? Is it stationary? Is it moving? Is it, again, stationary? Is it, is it burning? Is it, what color is it? What smell does it bring? What uh, sound does it have? And I would go in there and have her close her eyes and go and describe every detail and modality of sensation and uh, submodality distinctions that just broke it down into just components. And whatever she would say, I would then take the opposite sensation. So if she said it's, it's red and black, I'd say, okay, blue and white, and say it's, 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 uh, you know, it's awful, it's ugly. I'd say it's beautiful and it's, and it's, uh, it's uh, pretty. And what I would do is I would put in her mind the complete complementary opposite perception and separate them and put them in a the box. And I would imagine her seeing this one that's owl pain and this other one that represented the opposite pleasure. And uh, whatever the modalities and distinctions she could make in representation brain, I would come up with the complete opposites. And then I would imagine her, or she would have her imagine, that these two boxes are being slammed together and exploding each other and dissolving each other and birthing light. Kind of like a particle nanoparticle merging and making light. And I have her do this until there was nothing in her association she could find associated with the pain side. And the other one was gone. They're just both just disappear, poof into energy. And she would have 75%, sometimes 90% reduction in pain. She could actually stand up and she goes, where's my pain? I go, it was in your representation in your brain. Now, if you've ever hit your shin, as I said earlier, and banged it on a table or something, you immediately went down and rubbed it. Oh, gosh. And you probably cussed. You probably didn't say, oh, McGillicuddy. You probably said some cuss words, something that you normally wouldn't say, that you normally repress in society. And the reason being is, according to Melzack Wall, which is an old gate theory back in the 70s, that if you mechanoreceptors, which are tactile receptors, that you touch your thing and rub it, those are large diameter neurons that go up into the thalamus and close the sensory perception of pain and shut it off where you can't perceive the pain. And if you then say cuss words or whatever, they release endorphins and kephalons. Believe it or not, cussing serves a biological value because it releases opium, opioids in the brain, and kephalons, endorphins, dendorphins, et cetera. And so what it does is it makes you feel pleasure and shuts down the pain and modulates the pain. And all of a sudden you feel, oh, that's a lot easier. So you rub it, you keep rubbing it like that and you keep going, yeah. And then what happens is those are changing the ratios of the transmitters. See, every time you change your ratios of perception, you change neurotransmitters, modulators, regulators, and hormones in the body. All of the regulators, transmitters, hormones, et cetera, are all based on ratios of perceptions, not just pain perception, but any perception. If I, um, if I make you associate uh, a pleasure with something in visual, um, if you perceive it very visual, those transmitters of pleasure would go up. And if I, and you saw something painful and disgusting, the, the, it would go the other direction. You'd have substances like paint P substance, which is substance P, which is a pain polypeptide or a series of, of uh, transmitters. So your ratios of perception have a lot to do with the ratios of the hormones, transmitters, and regulators in the brain, and the ratios of what nerves are activated. See, when you stimulate some nerve ending, there are nerve endings for pain. There are no nerve endings for pleasure that so far they've found. Isn't that interesting? We have pain sensitivities, but we have modulators from the areas of the brain based on association to determine whether or not that pain is going to be pleasure or pain. If like I said, I could turn it in where if all of a sudden you found out that your husband was late and um, he had stains on his collars and you thought, what the heck has he done? And you immediately jump to the conclusion and perceive that he's been mess having an affair or something. And then you find out that the reason he's late, it's not because of an affair, is that there was a traffic fatality on the, on the highway, a, a crash, and he was trying to save people's lives. He got out of his car and he went out and tried to help him and he's late. And he's got Mark holding the person who was nearly dying, getting him to a place where he could get to the hospital. Then you all of a sudden you would think, well, this is terrible, this is pain. And all of a sudden you find out new information and all of a sudden you want to hug the person. 
the same particular stimulus now has a different association with it. And now you are attracted instead of repelled. We have an area of the brain called the amygdala, which is a desire center. It has a nucleus accumbens for pleasure if it's stimulated and has another one, the pallidum, uh, for pain. And this, uh, this, this amygdala is kind of a desire center, desire to avoid the pain and desire to seek the pleasure. Avoid the predator, which could eat you, which could chew you up and make you painful, or the pre pre prey, which is food that makes you feel good. That's why people get consumption and eat a lot to feel good. A lot of people who are in pain eat to try to feel better because it stimulates the nucleus accumbens. What's interesting is if you have perceptions of things that support your values, you can actually take the pain threshold and change it. If you have perceptions that see more challenges that represent predator, the pain can be heightened. <clears throat> you can take any stimulus and heighten it. You probably had little ulcers in your mouth. And um, if all of a sudden you find something else that's stressing you and aggravating you, uh, the pain even more aggravated, it's like really gets aggravated. But if all of a sudden you get focused on something that's not even bothering you and it's actually invigorating, inspiring you and supporting you, the pain levels can change. Your pain and pleasure, as Anaxagora said, are based on lopsided perceptions or ratios of perceptions, better put. So you can change your perceptions. When, when a pain and stimulus comes in from the dorsal root of the spinal cord from some injury, what's interesting is it has fibers that go immediately over to the other side of the body to avoid and get your arms and legs on the opposite side of the body, the contralateral side of the body to respond, to go out. But it also sends fibers up into the, into the middle of the brain, or into the, up the spinal cord, into the brain stem and different levels of the brain all the way up to the cortex, all the way up to the thalamus and then the cortex. It also has, so it has, because sometimes it has to turn your head for the pain, sometimes to blink, sometimes it has to respond and speak. So various levels of the brain are activated to get a response to the stimulus that you're perceiving. And you also have all kinds of different layers of the brain that are actually modulating and governing that response. And so depending on the associations of the brain, you can modulate that response and calm it down or accentuate it. You can dramatize it if you polarize it further and you can completely neutralize it and turn it into pleasure if you stack up enough associations, like I said, the billionaire and the private jet and everything else to slum, slamming of the thumb. I mean, I've asked people in seminars, if I slam their thumb, but I gave them a billion dollars plus a private jet and a big home and everything else, they'd say, slam it, baby, slam it. Because the associations were more benefit than drawback. And they'd endure it and not even think about the pain as much because they think, wow, I've got these opportunities. A matter of the work I would have to do to have that lifestyle. Now I've got, I just have to have a slam on the thing for a few weeks of discomfort. And that would even be discomfort possibly because the brain would represent it differently. <clears throat> we have the capacity to transform our perceptions of pain and pleasure. And this is interesting. You won't, you have a thing called acute pain, which is usually from some sort of destruction of a nerve ending or destruction of a cell that's causing, you know, a release of, uh, you know, inflammatory responses and we cause pain. <clears throat> But that's, that's acute pain. That's a real biological thing that we can trace it down a nerve to a place where there's some sort of inflammatory response, heat and swelling and, and pain, et cetera. But you also have chronic pain. There's no biological reason for the pain, but we have pain um, that is because we have more associations and advantages and disadvantages. It's called glial pain. And glial pain are 10 to one times the number of neurons in the brain. They're there to modulate and, and uh, regulate the nerves and they respond to our intentions and attentions. And if we have an intention uh, to actually get advantages over disadvantages that prolong the pain, we will keep the pain going. I had a lady in um, at the Merriam Hotel in Dublin. This is so cool. So she had, it was referred to me by a, a, another doctor there. And she said that she's claimed that she's had pain her whole life. I went, okay. She said, since she can remember. And I go, okay. And all her life she's had pain. I said, okay, so what's the benefit of her pain? She goes, well, there's no benefit to the pain. I go, I know, I know that's what your perception is, but let's, what's the benefit of the pain? Because nobody's gonna chronically uh, keep pain. Nobody's gonna do anything without an advantage, without a, over a disadvantage. So if there's no biologic, she'd been to specialists, no biological reason for the pain. They've, they've drilled it out. They can't find any source of pain, but she's got pain. And I said, so, 
no one is going to continue to do something unless they perceive more advantage and disadvantage. Everything is strategic. So I said, so what's the advantage you're getting out of the pain? She goes, I can't think of it. I said, look again. I don't know. Look again. And after prodding her for about probably seven, eight minutes, all of a sudden she came to a realization. She said, well, people listen to me. They do things for me. Okay, great. What else? They feel sorry for me. Good. What else? So you're, you're, you, if you tell people about your pain, they're attentive to it. At least some of them. Some people are. Yeah. And we went, kept asking, what's another benefit of the pain? And all of a sudden, she just got tear in her eyes. And she said, wow. I, I just all of a sudden thought about when I first had it. I just remembered a moment when I first noticed the pain. She had a sister who is really good looking, very active in school and academic and sports wise, an exceptional girl. And the parents gave her a lot of attention because she was getting awards and getting good grades and, you know, winning, winning things in sports and Miss Popular. And, and, and she was like the, you can't do anything wrong kind of thing. Well, the girl, her sister, person with pain, could never compete with that. So the way she got attention was injury, uh, pain, stomach ache. And that way she would get the attention from the parents. And she found out that she was doing that. And all of a sudden she remembered that. And she looked at me and she said, do you think it's remotely possible that I've been doing that as a, all my life? And I go, yep. So what's the benefit of the pain? Huh? And all of a sudden she started crying and she goes, wow, could I have actually done this? I said, yeah. She says, nobody's ever asked me this question. What's the benefit of my pain? I said, I know. And what would be the drawback if you're out of, got out of pain? I asked her that one too. I said, if you got rid of all your pain, what's the, what's the, you'll have a fantasy. People have a fantasy. You got to realize that many philosophers have thought that pain and pleasure are like on a spectrum. Others believe they're isolated. My observation is that they're pairs of opposites, kind of like Heraclitus said. And these pairs of opposites if you, the more, let's, let's just imagine this. Let's say you meet somebody that you're highly infatuated with and you got this fantasy about who they're going to be. You're conscious of the upside, you're unconscious of the downside. And the pleasure of being with them, imagine if all of a sudden they disappeared and somebody else took them away, right? Some other male or female took them away from you. The pain of, you would feel pain of the loss. You'd have grief and sensations of grief because of the infatuation. But if you resented them and somebody took them away, you'd be relieved. So when you resent somebody and you stack up associations that are more pain and pleasure and you see more drawbacks and benefits, if they leave you, there's a relief. If they come near you, it's a pain. Being around them is a pain. But if all of a sudden you're infatuated with somebody, if they leave you, there's pain. And if they get around you, there's pleasure because of associations you make in your brain. And, and I've been teaching in the, the breakthrough experience, my, my signature program, which I've taught for 32 years plus, that I can change any form. You can associate anything with anything. You can change a heaven into a hell of a hell of into heaven, as John Milton said, by asking quality questions to make you conscious of the unconscious information that you're not aware of. And when you actually bring it into balance, you transcend pain and pleasure. You actually experience love. I know that sounds crazy, but I've been doing it for years. The second you bring your perceptions into perfect balance, there's a feeling of order. There's a feeling of appreciation, love there. So I think what the brain does is actually tries to modulate and homeostate the perceptions that are pain or pleasure and to try to bring it back into balance so you can be authentic. Because otherwise, when you're in pain, you can justify your aggression. And if you're in pleasure, you can justify your, your passiveness. And these are two expression repressions. Some philosophers thought that pain and pleasure are just expressions and repressions of perception. And I really believe that's that's true. So if I take and, and, and ask you, what's the drawback to somebody you're infatuated with and calm it down, the fear of loss of them goes down. I've been doing that on 4,000 cases of death with grief with my Demartini method. It's amazing watching it. And if I take the thing that you resent and I show you the upsides, all of a sudden the fear of them coming in your life is gone. So the pain of them coming near you has disappeared and the pain of them leaving you has disappeared, which means that you can take and ask quality questions and ask 
ask these questions, answer, make new associations of brain and change the transmitters because the ratio does affect the transmitters, uh, the modulators, the hormones, the physiology and the response. And literally uh, fill in gaps where the normal stimuli sets up reflexes and synaptic reflexes and transmitters, you fill in those gaps and that you can't sensate that pain. It's really amazing. So the, the reception of the pain in the brain itself can be overruled, just like mechanoreceptors and saying cuss words can fill in with transmitters and make that other transmitter from the stimulus not there, and you can actually neutralize the pain. So what I'm, what I'm really leading to here <clears throat> is what Naxigora said. And even John Bonica from New York, he said that pain is a private sensation hurt, has no, you might say, objective data to support it. Other than you have nociceptors that show inflammation, that doesn't mean that you have pain because you've they have done studies where people have the same amount of inflammatory response and tremendous differences in the gradation of pain. Some don't even respond. I had a guy named Buddy, Buddy Westinghouse, magnificent gentleman. He was an ex-rodeo star. He had no fingers left because he yanked his fingers off. He had a little bit of a thumb. That's about it. He yanked all his fingers off from rodeo. And he had broken ribs and he had skull fractures and he had, gosh, all kinds of things. His wife, Lily, was what they call a pusillanimous, and he was a stoic. You could hit him with a sledgehammer and he wouldn't feel the pain. He had minimized it. And you touch her, just touch her. She, oh! she was exaggerating the pain. And very common people in marriage, you'll find some people that are more exaggerate, more minimized the pain. The stoic, stoic that minimize it and the pusillanimous that, that bring it on the wussies as they call them. And so it's in, what it is, is these, we have different set points for these pains and thresholds based on ratios of perceptions, based on how we've seen life. If we have a fantasy about how life is and life's not matching it, we can be depressed and in pain. And by the way, the same depression re re reflexes and pathways are similar to being injured. So we are literally registering pain in our life because we're comparing our current reality to a fantasy. If we have a fantasy about how life's supposed to be and life doesn't match it, that's pain. If we have a nightmare and we've exceeded it, that's pleasure. Our thresholds are altered that way. We have a hedonic pathway and an ahedonic pathway, a pleasure and a pain pathway, you might say. And they're all based on racist perceptions. So if I could take somebody that's got a, a chronic pain, like an osteosarcoma, and knock it down 70 plus percent, 90% in some cases, and I trained her on how to do that. So when she was in a situation, because pain medications wasn't doing it, pain medications were not really getting the whole picture because sometimes we have strategies. I had <clears throat> two people that both had cancer and I worked with them um, in my office one time and we, they were having, one had uh, osteosarcoma and one had lung cancer and the one could barely breathe and the other one is incredible pain. The other one is pain from breathing. And we had a major blowout uh, communication system because they hadn't been, they, they'd been resenting each other for 53, 52 years, almost 50, yeah, 52 years, 53 years almost. They hadn't made love in 53 years. Can you imagine that being married? They were together because of religious beliefs. They didn't want to get divorced because they thought they're going to go to eternal damnation or something, some crazy thing like that. And <clears throat> they were still together, but they were resenting each other and they're both in pain. They both had cancer. And we sat down and got all the stuff out and had a big hash out in my office. Took a few, took a while. And boy, and their pain thresholds and their symptoms just subsided right on the spot. It was amazing. And they were told they had about two to three weeks to live, both of them. And they made it six more months. They did die, but they had six more months of communication. So our perceptions have an impact on it. We have the capacity to alter it. Remember, you can't have fear of the unknown. You have fear of the content of your mind. You can't have resentment of the unknown. You have resentment of the per perceptions and content of your mind. And you're not going to have pain without representation in the brain. And if you identify what that representation is and change the races of the perception associated with it, you change your thresholds. You may not completely eliminate the pain of a physical active pain, a crushing bone, for instance, but you can absolutely make a change in it. And that's been shown and demonstrated. I mean, people used hypnosis for, for decades, centuries where they, they go in there and change the representation of the brain and all of a sudden they don't feel certain things or they do feel something. 
So I just want you to know that you have the capacity. Now, somebody might say, well, what? okay, so what's the purpose of pain and pleasure? Mm, this is a great question. I believe that pain and pleasure, support and challenge, ease and difficulty, you know, cooperation, competition are both necessary for growth. If imagine you had nothing but a prey, food, that was pleasurable to eat, and there was no such thing as a predator, you would have a hedonic path that would be excessive. You could go into gluttony and fatness and gain weight and get obese and then have certain symptoms in the body that would eventually wake you up and realize that's not the path. That's too much pleasure. You could also have something as predator without prey and you would end up having you know, emaciation, starvation because you never get to eat. But what's been shown in the food chain of biology is that you need play, pleasure and pain. You need support and challenge. You need uh, the hedonistic and ahedonistic. You need the, the prey and the predator to keep you fit. Maximum fitness, maximum productivity, maximum fulfillment, the meaning, the mean between the pairs of opposites is the center. And I've defined in, in uh, love as being the synthesis and synchronicity of all complementary opposites. Because I've been doing the great the rates experience for 32 years. And I've shown people how to balance out their perception with my Martini method. And the moment they balance it, they come to a point where there's tears of gratitude and they feel a thank you. I love you. So I'm going to make a statement here that I believe that the purpose of pain and pleasure is to train us to be authentic and to appreciate and to love and to make sure that we're moderated in our behavior and have wisdom, the old cardinal virtues of the Greeks, to allow us to see things as they are, not as we subjectively bias them to be. You know, when we're out in the wild and we are seeing prey and we've got to eat it like an animal, uh, we accelerate with a subjective bias, the adrenaline stimulation to, to run after that animal and catch it. And if we see predator, we accelerate the adrenaline again to run away from it. <clears throat> So in survival modes, in our amygdala, we automatically skew things into pleasures and pains in order to capture food and to avoid being eaten, pleasure and pain. So we have the capacity with our executive function, the medial prefrontal cortex, that area sends fibers down and glutamate and GABA transmitters and goes down and moderates those and calms down those distractions because the thing you infatuate with and seek or the thing you avoid and resent occupy your mind as a survival mechanism but the second you're living by your highest values, doing what's really meaningful, doing what's inspiring to you, those calm down and the degree of pleasure and pain calm down and center themselves. And what's interesting, the very center, the amygdala, the very centers for play, pleasure and pain, the pain center and the pleasure stimulus, um, they're there moderating the pain. So we can literally neutralize it. So if we're living by our highest values, doing what is most meaningful, doing something we love doing, something that inspires us naturally, something we can't wait to get up in the morning and do, we will reduce the extremes of pleasure and pain, the fantasies and nightmares of life. And remember, the more the fantasy of life, the more life compared to it is, is miserable. So that's a pain. So anytime you separate that, that's what Anaxagoras said. It's the separation of the distinction of pain and pleasure that gives these responses and the lopsided perceptions. So if we moderate those and neutralize that, the executive center, the forebrain, the most advanced part of the brain modulates and moderates the polarities of perception. That's why if you see when you have pain and ask how specific this pain helping me fulfill what's most meaningful to me and answer that question, I guarantee you that pain will drop as you're sitting there answering that question. And if you have pleasure, ask, What's the downside of the pleasure? You can neutralize the pleasure. Your intuition is constantly trying to make you conscious of the unconscious information that's trying to moderate, neutralize things so you can maximize your, your fitness, maximize your fulfillment. So I believe that pain and pleasure are feedback mechanisms guiding us to the most authentic, inspired, purposeful life to do something we really love with the people we love. It's acting as a mechanism to help us fulfill that. It's not just survival oriented. It's also survival scaled up to thrival. If we're living in survival, we're going to be sitting there and having probably the pain and pleasures run us. We run by the outside world. If we actually moderate it by doing something that's deeply meaningful and connecting both pain and pleasure to meaning, that's the key. The Stoics did that. They premeditated on the so-called evils. 
the pains that could go wrong with a, an objective to prepare for the and mitigate the risks to balance out the rewards. The rewards of pleasure, the risks for pain, they brought them into balance and then they pursued their action and they got greater results. People that are only looking at fantasies and then unprepared for the nightmares get distress and people that are prepared for both sides get eustress and eustress is wellness promoting and moderates the so-called pains and pleasures. So our brain, our physiology, our nervous system is set up in such a way that we have the capacity to transform our life. And that's the beauty of this whole thing. It's not what happens to us on the outside. It's how we perceive what we decide to do with it and how we act upon it. So if we go in there and uh, take advantage of this information, it just might transform your awareness of the pains and pleasures in your life. The next time you're in pain, play with this. Maybe watch this video a few times so some of that sinks in and inculcate and experiment with it. Because I've seen people that have been, uh, I had a lady that was uh, live at a seminar in my two seven day program, the Prophecy One Experience, and um, where I'm helping people become prophets of their destiny instead of victims of their history. And in that program, a lady literally started to get up from uh, under a table. She lifted her foot under a table and ripped the top of it about two and a half inches, about literally about three eighths of an inch deep. It was a bloody mess. And she screamed. And they ran and got ice and they got, you know, towels and all kind of stuff. And while she was doing that, they held the skin, put the skin back on it, and just kind of held it down and put pressure on it because she didn't want to run and walk. Somebody else did it for her. And we did. I said, this is the perfect opportunity right now to demonstrate this. And at first, people thought that was kind of cruel. But I actually took that, identified what the pains were right there on the spot, found out the opposites, did the exercise right there and calmed it down 35%, literally in a matter of minutes. And the lady was blown away and her husband was just blown away. She says, I can't believe the pain's down. And so by the time people got back with everything else, we were already starting to reduce the pain perceptions because we stacked up new associations. So don't let the outer world run your life. Let the voice and the vision on the inside, let the wisdom that you gain on the inside moderate the extremes on the outside. And then you're in command. Otherwise the world around you is gonna run you in the little accents and know this, my observation is people that get cocky and manic and get elated and get addicted to fantasies and get a, 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 a really elated, pride before the fall is the old saying, are more likely to injure themselves and have that. And the pain is there to bring into their life to calm down their addiction to fantasies and pleasures. Pain is actually your friend, it's not your enemy, if you put it into context. And so just want to give that feedback today and give you some, some uh, insight on what pain and pleasure is and the purpose of it. I think it's trying to help you be authentic. It's helping you do something you really love to do. And if, there's a, if you want to get a book, get a book called The Brilliant Function of Pain by Milton Ward. He shows that without pain, your life isn't going to do too well. Might read that. I used to give all my patients that, that little book and give them a summary of it to make sure they understood the importance of pain. Pain and pleasure are both necessary. That's why they're there, to help you fulfill your mission in life. Now, for just uh, a little reminder here, I have a coming, uh, an upcoming program, a masterclass, called Discover the Hidden Order that Unites and Empowers Us All. And this is going to be something that uh, I know you're going to want to hear. This is going to blow your mind, because what I've been doing in the Breakthrough Experience programs and other programs is showing people how things that go in their life that they think are mistakes, how they're not, and what's the hidden order of why they're manifesting their life. You know, disorder is simply missing information, unconscious information. If you answer the question and take the entropy and turn it back into mega entropy and find the hidden order of it and the reasons why, you transform your life from mystery to, to something even more profoundly where you're taking command in your life and living by design. So this powerful program, this masterclass, discover the hidden order that unites and powers us all. Uh, I know you're gonna, you're gonna love. So I look forward to seeing you, that's coming up. All you have to do is, and if you sign up for it, you're gonna get a free gift called Awaking Your Astronomical Vision. Please take advantage of this. I know you're gonna get a lot out of this course. If you got something out of today, you're gonna definitely get something out of this program that I'm doing, the masterclass. I look forward to seeing you there. Sign up now, take advantage of it. And thank you for being with me today.